part of the Civil War Heartlands Leaders Trail is the Crawford Long Museum, located in Jefferson, Georgia. Crawford Long attended the University of Georgia in the 1830s, which at that time was known as Franklin College, where he roomed with the future Vice President of the Confederate States of America, Alexander H. Stevens. Long became a noted physician and is credited with the discovery of ether anesthesia for the surgical use in 1842. During the war, he served as a Confederate surgeon and in the Athens Home Guard. He and Stevens were chosen as two outstanding Georgians to be honored in the statutory hall in the nation's capital. Our program opens with a tour of the Crawford Long Museum in tribute to this renowned Georgian and his contributions to the world in the field of medicine. We're in the beautiful city of Jefferson, Georgia, in Crawford Long Museum, and we are visiting with the director of the museum, Vicki Starnes. Vicki, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for coming here to visit us in our little gym, our little treasure that we're so proud of here in Jefferson. Dr. Crawford Long has a legacy here in Georgia for doing many things, and he's world-renowned for doing the first surgery under anesthesia, the ether that was used for many, many years. Well, he discovered that it could be used as an anesthetic to do painless surgery. In fact, there was a fad uh, back in the 1800s of, it was the time of the traveling medicine shows where they would inhale the laughing gas or the nitrous oxide and they would, you know, act silly and do things like that. So kids at that time would have something they called a frolic party. And that's kind of like we would think of it as uh, keg parties today at college. <laughs> but they would come to Dr. Long and they would want nitrous oxide. And he couldn't get that. But he knew that sulfuric ether had the same exhilarating effects. So he provided them with the ether. And he would observe that at the parties that they would inhale this ether and they would, you know, act silly and have a great time and fall off the porch and bang their <laughs> knees and not really seem to feel any pain or seem to remember it. So that's what gave him the idea that he could do painless surgery. And James Venable was his first patient, and he was a college student that had attended frolic parties before. So he had these two tumors on the back of his neck, and he didn't want to have them removed because he knew it was going to be painful. Well, Dr. Long convinced him that he could remove them and he wouldn't feel any pain. So that's what he did, and it happened right here on the site of where the museum stands today. It was Dr. Long's office on March 30th, 1842 is when the first painless surgery happened. And another little known fact is that on March 30th, that's National Doctors' Day, so something that the museum staff does every year in honor of Dr. Long's date that he did the first painless surgery. We take red carnations, which is the symbol of Doctors' Day, and we deliver them to all of the local doctors in hospitals in the area. The building that we're standing in today actually was his surgical suite. Today it's a brick building, but it was a wooden structure, but it's on the site of where his office stood when he did the first painless surgery. After he discovered that anesthesia was helpful to the patients when they had surgery, what did his practice look like as he went on? Was he a general practitioner? His love was pharmacy. So he practiced in Jefferson as the town doctor doing house calls and I mean that was what they did back then their most important tool was their horse that got him to their house calls but he moved briefly moved his family to Atlanta for about a year decided that really wasn't where he wanted to raise his family so that's when he moved to Athens and he was in Athens with his brother he opened his drugstore and his practice there so he was there during the Civil War and he knew that civil unrest was getting ready to happen, so he had the forethought to backstock or stockpile some drugs, some manufactured drugs out of the north before the Union blockades went into effect. Mm -hmm. So Athens was really one of the last places to run out of the manufactured drugs during the war when the blockades went into effect because of him thinking ahead, you know. So he served as the Surgeon General for the Confederacy during that time and then he actually received a pardon after the war for his part in that. So he lived in Athens until his death 
and he is actually buried in the Oconee Hill Cemetery. He and his family, most of his family, are buried there. And what about his wife and children? Mary Caroline Swain is who he married, and he had 12 children, but only seven of them actually lived to adulthood. And out of the seven that lived, only his son, Edward Crawford, had any children. So to find any direct descendants of his, Mm -hmm. we've kind of lost track of any. We know of like great nephews, great great nephews, that type from his brother's line. But yeah, I guess it was kind of typical to have that many children (laughs) back then. But you know, his statue stands in Statuary Hall today in Washington, D.C., because he was not actually recognized during his lifetime as the discoverer of anesthesia. It wasn't until after his death when his daughters took up the crusade to really prove with his witness affidavits that he was the first to do painless surgery, because he didn't publish his results right away. There were some doctors, Morton and Wells, out of Boston, Massachusetts, of course, bigger town. You know, they have the priority of actually publishing their results first, but theirs was several years after he had done his. He didn't publish his until after he read about theirs, you know. So <laughs> so there was some ether controversy on who was the first, but he is recognized as the first, and his statue, like I said, stands in Statuary Hall in Washington, D.C. All of the things that we see here in the museum today, are they personal effects of the Long family, or are they just historical items that you've collected? No, we're very fortunate to have some personal belongings of Dr. Long's. We have his medicine bag. You know, I mentioned that his love was pharmacy and that he made your medicines. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we have his medicine bag. This was in his possession the night that he died. He was on a house call delivering a baby when he had an aneurysm and his last words were, take care of the mother and child before tending to me. We also have his gold pocket watch, which is made from Dahlonega gold. And a little story about this is that during the war between the states he had gave his gold pocket watch and his wit signed witness affidavits of who the gentleman that witnessed the first surgery to his daughter and she put them in a mason jar and hung them underneath her skirts to go out and bury so they wouldn't be taken by the union raiders so he liked to read shakespeare we have his complete collection of shakespeare we have his wedding tie we have a lace shawl that belonged to mary caroline his wife that he brought back from a trip to new york one time Is this his personal? His personal eyeglasses, yes. Everything in the Long Gallery are personal belongings of the Long family. His Um, mortar and pestle. And what are these? That's like a little pocket medicine case where you would take, if you didn't want to take the big medicine bag. (laughs) Just like the little surgical roll there with his tools, too. Now, is there something special about this little teacup? That was just the Long family china. We also have their silver over in another vitrine over here. But a neat story about the piece of wood that we have here, that big wooden bowl, Mm -hmm. is there was a mulberry tree that stood outside of his office. And someone had forethought to, when it died, there was a disease that went through and killed a lot of the trees in the area. They saved it, and they kept it in the Jefferson Mills for years, the pieces of the trunk. And then they put it in the the museum basement. So two years ago, I guess it was, we needed to get rid of the wood that was in the basement. Mm -hmm. And we found a local artisan to craft pens and letter openers and ornaments and things like that. So basically, it's your witness tree. It witnessed the first painless surgery. Once that wood's gone, we won't have any more of that left. So we have those items available in our gift shop. And the baby high chair. So is that all the long children? This, yes, in it? it is. all of. And then this was his rocking chair as well. We're very fortunate to have so many long family heirlooms. Well, this is actually an apothecary shop and it's what you would have seen in a doctor's office back in his time because the doctor was also the pharmacist. He made your medicine. So we have a pill making exhibit that shows how pills were made. You would have to collect the botanical medicines and extract the compounds that were important out of them. So you see things in this doctor's office that you wouldn't see in a doctor's office today, like a fruit press and a coffee grinder. 
And the reason is that they use those items to be able to crush leaves and grind the berries and roots and things like that to extract the medicinal compounds out of it. And then they would make something sort of like the consistency of a cookie dough and roll Mm -hmm. it out and put it across the pill maker. And then they would pull the bar down to cut little individual doses of pills, and then they would put them on the pill finisher and roll them with their finger into a round shape, and then you'd put them into the pill finisher or kind of swirl it into a powder to coat it to give you the handmade pills, of which we have examples out here, like the little red ones and the black ones there are handmade pills. And what do we see here? This is an amputation kit. You know, a sign of a good doctor back then was one that how fast they could amputate. Because you think that, you know, there wasn't a lot of anesthesia available. So that was a sign of a good doctor, how quickly they could amputate. Because, you know, before anesthesia, Mm -hmm. if someone had to have surgery and they came to the doctor's office and needed to have a toe amputated or a finger or whatever... There was a bell outside the doctor's office, and the doctor would ring a bell to notify the town that surgery was going to happen and that they needed some strong men to come in and help hold the patient down. And even in our doctor's office here, in this uh, exam table from, you know, about 1880, Mm -hmm. there's a little wooden dowel that you could use to bite on. Mm -hmm. And these are the prosthetics that they used to use? Yes, these are prosthetics. This peg leg that we have that Mm -hmm. was from 1864 was actually a Confederate veteran, and he had a choice of, after the war, of either receiving a pension or receiving a peg leg, and he chose the peg leg. And we're now in the anesthesia room. Vicki, tell us what we're seeing here. Okay, this is our development of anesthesia exhibit, and it begins here with like early inhalation anesthesia, where you can see like the little ether dropper bottles and the masks that would have been used to drip it on so that the patient could inhale the gases. And then it kind of progresses on to the handheld inhalers where you would have put a sponge like in the bottom of that and held it and put your mouth on it and inhaled the vapors that way. But you have to think too that the doctor and everyone in the room are actually inhaling the same vapors. So then it became the next step. It was sort of the rise of the machine where they began to recapture the gases and use different gases, adding oxygen, and then throughout the exhibit, all the machines kind of progress and show different advancements, like maybe they added um, filters or they added gauges onto the latest machine that we received, and it's not really even the most current. This, this is a 2001 that was donated by the medical students from Emory University. And I've also noticed that you have an audio tour for those who visit the museum. Do they need to tune in on their cell phones? Actually, no. Glad you brought that up. That is something new that we just started several months ago. We got donations from the Georgia Society of Anesthesiologists. We got donations from our nonprofit board. And then with the city operating budget, we were able to purchase the audio tour system. So that's something that if you're a visitor and you don't want to take the time to read all of our interpretive signage, for an additional $3, you can rent the audio tour wand and it tells you the story. We have like little signs throughout the museum that'll say press button one to hear. And it's really great because it really brings the story alive. It's got so many sound effects and the music and you hear the horse and the, you know, it's it's really a a nice little added value that you can take advantage of. I did want to note that we are handicap accessible and we do enjoy having all of the field trips, whether it be a school group or whether it be a senior group, we welcome them all. How long is the walking tour, Vicki? To actually listen to it, all seven stops, it's a total of 30 minutes. Today our guest has been the director of the Crawford Long Museum in Jefferson, Georgia, Vicki Starnes. If you would 
also like to take the tour, you can go on their website to get directions through Google, and you can also find out about all the different events that we've spoken of today that occur throughout the year, especially the new Smithsonian exhibit that's coming up in January of 2017. Vicki, thank you for being such a gracious host and letting us know about the wonderful history and legacy that's in our own backyard of Dr. Crawford Long. Thank you so much, Candace. I really appreciate you coming today and taking the time to look at our treasure that we have here. And give our listeners the website address where they can find out more information. It's www.crawfordlong.org.